Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today's show is a bit longer than usual, and that wasn't even on purpose. It's just that the conversation I was having just ended up taking a lot longer, and the stories kept coming, and I I hope you guys all really enjoy it, because the person we're talking to today is a man named Wayne Flint, Dr. Wayne Flint. He is now a professor emeritus of the Department of History at Auburn University, and he was, he's won a lot of teaching awards. He was a distinguished university professor for many years, and he's actually been nominated for several, several Pulitzer Prizes for his work in history, especially history of the Deep South. But the book that I'll be chatting with him about is a book that he published in 2017 called Mockingbird Songs, My Friendship with Harper Lee. Now, most of you will recognize the name Harper Lee immediately. Her full name was Nell Harper Lee, and she is the author of what's considered to be one of the greatest books of the 20th century, and certainly one of the greatest American novels of the 20th century, which is To Kill a Mockingbird. And Dr. Wayne Flint had been friends with uh, Harper Lee for decades. He spent a lot of time with her. Uh, He wrote back and forth with her. He visited her. And so he really has the inside story on Harper Lee's life. Uh, Most of you will know that Harper Lee, of course, actually won the Pulitzer Prize in 1961 for her book, To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a fascinating look at racial tensions in the Old South. But also what she really does in that book is is she captures uh, what day-to-day Southern life looks like. Most of the characters and a lot of things that happened are actually modeled off her friends and neighbors. For example, the character Dill, in the book, is modeled after Truman Capote, uh, who is quite well known himself as a journalist and the author of a book called uh, In Cold Blood about several brutal murders that took place in Kansas. And Harper Lee was actually friends uh, with Truman Capote for years before he became consumed with jealousy over her Pulitzer Prize and the absolutely enormous success uh, of her novel. Now, Harper Lee died just a couple of years ago And because she was such a private person, there's only a few people who knew her really well. And Dr. Wayne Flint was one of those people. And so when I was considering uh, what sort of literature show to do, because it's time that we took a look at at literature again on this show, uh, I I decided it was was time to to talk about To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, especially because it relates to so many different current issues. And the book has survived so long as a classic. And I started looking around for somebody who actually knew her and could tell us about what she was like and and describe what it was like uh, to chat with her and what her perspectives were. And I realized that Dr. Wayne Flint was was just the right man to talk to. So uh, I fired him off an email and he agreed to come on the show. And this is that conversation. How did you first meet Harper Lee? I met her uh, in a serendipitous serendipitous uh, moment. Uh, We had uh, planned an uh, Auburn University History and Heritage Festival, and we would take these to small towns through our humanities center, uh, using local committees to help us plan what the local folks were interested in, whether their churches, their writers, their athletic programs, whatever. And then we tried to recruit faculty to go with us. Uh, At this particular one of the first year of that program, we uh, uh, went to Eufaula, Alabama, which is a small town down on the Chattahoochee River, and uh, Nell's uh, sister, Louise Connor, was sort of a grand dame of that town, having uh, by then become the widow of one of the most important businessmen, and she uh, was on the steering committee. We asked her for suggestions for speakers and that sort of thing, and she mentioned uh, her sister, Harper Lee, but she said, of course, she won't do it. Right. At that point, we uh, uh, thought about Truman Capote, uh, and uh, obviously that made Louise, the sister, very nervous uh, because she knew that Truman was by then uh, abusing both drugs and alcohol so badly that he made a fool of himself when he spoke. So in an act of incredible uh, generosity to her sister, uh, Harper Lee said that she would come and be the keynote speaker. And to fully appreciate this, Jonathan, you'd have to uh, know uh, 
uh, terrified Nell was of speaking in public uh, to the point where for weeks she was uh, overcome with nausea and uh, terrible fear uh, about speaking. And so to present a formal paper, which was the first time she'd done this since 1964. Wow. <laughs> so it had been 20 years since she had spoken in public. A uh, brilliant paper, I might add, on Alabama, early Alabama history and the romance uh, of history as opposed to the way in which historians tend to kill it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that was when we met her, and our son was 14 that night. So... Uh, uh, he queued up in line with all the children, and she signed his copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, and then we offered our copy of To Kill a Mockingbird, and she said very icily, I only sign for children. <laughs> so uh, we we felt insulted and felt that our one contact with Harper Lee had been an affirmation of her coolness and her thoughtlessness. Uh, so uh, we were not impressed, but uh, 10 years later we met... Uh, Alice Lee, the older sister, and Louise Connor from Eufaula again, when I spoke to a group of Methodist women on poverty in Alabama. And uh, uh, Louise, by, by the end of Widow, uh, asked us to come down and uh, chat with her, maybe go out to lunch. So on Sundays, Sunday afternoons uh, for years, uh, about every two or three months, we would go down to Eufaula take her over to Lumpkin, Georgia, to her favorite soul food restaurant, and uh, uh, we would just talk. And finally, she began to talk about her mother and father, the Finches, uh, uh, especially her mother's people. Uh, and uh, we became dear friends until Louise drifted off into dementia. And at that point, uh, Har uh, Harper, living in New York City, was terribly concerned about her sister, but did not come down. She didn't like to fly, just wouldn't fly, as a matter of fact. And, of course, Amtrak was an arduous train ride from New York City. So she would. She began to write, and uh, uh, we reconnected when she won an, uh, a prize from the Alabama Humanities Foundation. And uh, uh, she gave us uh, uh, her sister's new address and telephone number in Gainesville, where her son lived. And uh, so we we reconnected uh, about 10 years apart, <laughs> uh, 1983, the first time we met her. And then she wrote me a letter in 1992 when I wrote an op-ed column about the family. And she was chiding me for getting her, her chronology wrong. She was not the oldest. She was the youngest sister. So even then, <laughs> it was sort of an icy kind of situation. But then when her sister became ill and we became the source of information, uh, she became very warm, and we began to write, and then for 10 years exchanged uh, correspondence uh, uh, before she had her stroke. And then uh, after that, uh, we went down to see her uh, at least once a month, sometimes more frequently than that, when she lived back in Monroe in Alabama. So that's the story of our relationship chron chronologically. So the question that everybody is kind of wondering, because of course with the release of of the second book, Go Set a Watchman, a lot of people uh, you know are talking about what a solitary person she was, how she didn't give interviews. Uh, so what was Harper Lee actually like? Well, that's a that's a really good question, and I try to do that by by sort of wordsmithing a little bit because people have called her shy, people have called her reclusive. Uh, and there are a whole set of other words that uh, try to describe precisely who she was. But uh, she and my wife became really, really close friends. And I think the bond between them was that they were both very private people. They were not shy. They were not introverted. <laughs> right. uh, but they were intensely private uh, they didn't feel anybody had any right to know about them just because, in the case of of, uh, of Nell Harper Lee, uh, she was famous. And in the case of my wife, she was married to someone who was extroverted and garrulous and liked to talk and liked to be <laughs> the center of things. And my wife said, that's his world, that's not my world. And when people would probe for information about me by asking my wife or information about her, uh, she would just sort of say, uh, you know, I, I'm not interested in talking about that. And that would be a very good description of Nell. Uh, 
because to us, she was anything but shy or ex- or introverted. She was extremely social, extremely forthcoming, uh, revealing all sorts of things about herself uh, without without moving very deeply into the inner woman. The inner woman, I'd, I'm not sure anybody knows. Uh, I'm not sure uh, even her best friends in New York City, like Joy Brown, knew. Uh, so I think she was always private to the degree that there were parts of her that she felt no one needed to know about. Uh, but there were also parts of her that she revealed in just uh, a relationship of friendship is the best way to describe it. And she would tell us, in fact, I have 300 pages of notes uh, about her uh, uh, life, uh, which which I would write down when we left uh, the uh, uh, Meadows nursing home um, or assisted living. And uh, that uh, that was a part of her life that she revealed just in storytelling. Mm-hmm. What were a few parts of her life that she revealed during storytelling to you that sort of caught you by surprise, that you hadn't read anywhere in the newspaper, that this was sort of information that told you something about her uh, that, that you hadn't known before? Uh, there were so many that you, you, I, I could spend hours answering the question because uh, it was sort of like an onion, and she would peel off a little piece of the onion, and you'd say, oh, my goodness. And then the next time you were down there, she would peel off another completely different part of the onion, and you would say, oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, let me start off with uh, a fairly obvious uh, uh, answer that connected us very closely. Uh in, an, in a different life, I'm not so sure that Nell would not have been the most famous American historian who ever lived, because she was so graceful a writer, and she had an obsession with history, uh, especially the history of the place from which she came. She was a great fan of Macaulay, the British historian, which sort of surprised me, although I shouldn't have been, uh, given the era in which he wrote, a uh, sort of uh, glamorous, romantic, uh, Victorian kind of history. But uh, uh, she she, uh, she once said that uh, uh, the great thing about Macaulay is that he had such a gift for writing that he made history come alive. And for her, it was places like uh, Murder Creek, uh, a creek uh, near her home, uh, where the name of the creek came from a group of, of, of brigands, uh, one uh, uh, Anglo, one uh African American, uh, one Hispanic, who uh, ambushed a, a group of settlers in the early days of Alabama territorial life in the first part of the 19th century, and killed everyone, children, women, everybody. Um, and uh, the name of the creek was Murder Creek, or Burnt Corn Creek nearby where she lived also in her county. Uh, Burnt Corn Creek was the place where a group of Mississippi militia ambushed a group of Creek Indians coming back from Pensacola with guns and trading items. And that uh, basically launched uh, the war between the Creeks and the Americans, which resulted in Creek Indian removal, and also resulted in the greatest Indian massacre of whites in the history of the United States at Fort Mims, just below where she lived. And these are the sorts of things that she just had in her memory bank that... uh, it, it was almost as if when she was telling the story, uh, the story was a story that she observed herself. Right. That that's that's how precise it was, and uh, probably the most amazing part of that story is at the very time when uh, uh, lots of people were saying that she was demented and that she could not give informed consent to the publication of Ghost Set a Watchman. And she had long since been cut off from people by her lawyer uh, who wouldn't let uh, people visit her, old friends visit her. And there were only a few names on a list who were ushered into her presence. Uh, And during that very time, we were there one day, and uh, uh, the subject of her grandfather came up, and she began to talk about his Civil War record. And I said, well, that's your great-grandfather. She said, oh, no, that's my grandfather. Uh, She said, you know, the people on both sides of my family lived forever. They lived into their 90s. And she said, my grandfather was was alive and well into the 20th century. And she remembers the stories from her older sister, Alice, and uh, Louise. Uh, 
And she said he fought in the 15th Alabama. And remember, this is only a year or so before she died. And I said, uh, oh, my goodness, uh, the 15th Alabama was at Gettysburg. She said, oh, yes, on the second day of Gettysburg, the 15th Alabama, 900 strong, and coming from uh, the area of where she lived, uh, basically south uh, east Alabama, um, uh, turned the Union Army right flank, uh, held by a group of Maine, a regiment from Maine, commanded by Gordon Chamberlain, the famous uh, commander. And that was the decisive battle, and uh, it was almost a suicidal battle where both sides ran out of ammunition on the hottest day of the year, and and they were fighting hand to hand with uh, muskets used as as uh, battering uh, instruments and bayoneting each other. And uh, about a third of both regiments were either killed or wounded that day, uh, and uh, her grandfather was in that battle. And I said, but he survived. She said, yes, he survived. And I said, well, uh, do you have any stories of his survival? She said, yes. She said, and uh, uh, Colonel Oates, uh, who was the uh, commanding officer, in his memoir of the battle, he talks about the fact that uh, the ones who survived were the ones who could run fast. <laughs> that right. is, when they started down the hill <laughs> with Chamberlain's soldiers right behind them with bayonets and clubbing them to death. Uh, she said, my grandfather outran the others, and uh, I, I mean, I broke up. I just, I, you know, it, it wasn't this uh, this uh, bravado that you usually get from neo-Confederates about how brilliant and brave and courageous <laughs> that, uh, that their ancestors were. It was that once they decided they were going to lose the battle and they ran out of ammunition and they didn't have any water, her, her grandfather ran fast. And... Uh, uh, that sort of anecdotal approach to uh, to the people she came from is something you really expect from from Alabamians and from Southerners in general. That is the tide of genealogy and the tide of family. And she even begins to kill a mockingbird with this uh, dispute with her brother Jim, uh, the character Jim, over uh, where the uh, finches came from, and. Uh, uh, the uh, this the story uh, uh, derives directly from this intense concern for history and genealogy, and that's the way I, the reason I said we bonded partly, because in another life I would love to have written *To Kill a Mockingbird*, and perhaps in another life she would have loved to have written all my my histories about Alabama. <laughs> Why did she never try to write her own history? I, I understand that you know fiction. Fiction is a special thing. I've always viewed people who can write fiction, you know, as as somewhat magical because they can create this world out of nothing. And yes, it's rooted in reality usually at different points, but the fact that they can they can create this never ceases to astound me. But her skill with writing and and her flawless sentences, she could have used those to write the story that, as as you tell it, she spent decades researching after the publication of To Kill a Mockingbird anyway. That's correct. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, there's an interesting anecdote. Uh, in fact, I was going back through uh, my 300 pages of notes from our conversations with her. And it, we had a very interesting conversation about uh, 2015, not too long before she died. And I said, uh, uh, I remember your sister Louise telling us stories about your family and about your father, Coley Lee. And uh, that was the first time I really uh, came to know something of, of your family. Uh, he came, uh, her father came from a very ordinary small farm family. They, they didn't have any resources. And he, he had something equivalent to maybe an eighth or ninth grade education uh, when he dropped out of school uh, and, and was pretty much a self-learner. Uh, he did not go to law school. He apprenticed himself to a lawyer, as was common in that day. And uh, she said, well, when, when I wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, clearly uh, my father, Coley Lee, is Atticus Finch. So the uh, source of that, uh, of, of that part of the story is unmistakable. But she said uh, the, um, the other part of, of, of the book, and that would be the richness of the anecdotes about growing up, about little children, about pranks, about uh, 
falling, about playing ball, about being uh, Truman, uh, Truman Capote being the sissy, uh, uh, Bill being the sissy in the story, uh, Jim, her brother, being the, the brave, older, wiser brother. She said that's all Finch wisdom. That's not Lee wisdom. So it was not it was not uh, my father who was the source of the of, of of the narrative of the book. It was my Finch family. And she said uh, Christmas time routinely uh, they would go out to the Finchburg, uh, which was at one time. Uh, a river town as large as Monroeville when the Finches first came there to create a small plantation on the banks of the Alabama River. But she said as time passed, uh, the um, t- town of Finchburg disappears, and what's left is the Finch family of mansion. Uh, not a, It was a modest mansion, but it was still pretty opulent for the times. And she said we would go there, and there we would talk to our Finch grandparents, and we would connect to the uh, African-American children who were in the area who had been children of slaves. And she said since they were the only children to play with, we played with them as if they were a part of our family. And in, she said in some sense, uh, almost spiritually, they were part of our family. And so it's interesting that uh, the, the the towering figure in the book that everyone remembers is Atticus Finch. But the storyline of the family is not Atticus Finch, but it is her mother's people out in Finchburg. And I found that very interesting uh, because she creates the hero from her father, but she creates the narrative from her mother and her mother's people. How did she uh, receive the reaction of people in the South when she wrote this book? Because I think a lot of people forget now that this book was written in 1964, or at least published then, um, right when a lot of the issues she was writing about were extremely current. They weren't uh, they weren't past issues at that point. And she wrote this book that it, it's very hard to pinpoint her position on a lot of things because she doesn't create these easy-to-caricature people, right? Even when she, she writes about the example that always springs to my mind would be Mrs. DeBose, who, when she starts writing about this, this old lady, this grand old southern lady, you think she's just a hateful, wretched woman. And then uh, towards the end, you realize that she has this iron will and she has this character in her that you never know. And then this is used to, to essentially make the point that nobody is one-dimensional and that nobody is sort of the sum of the worst characteristics that they possess. Absolutely right. Uh, I think all great literature uh, is rooted in some kind of ambiguity. That is, uh, it, it's never simple. It's always more complicated. It may start off simple, and you may think, aha, uh, this is going to be easy to figure out. But then it becomes more and more complicated as you understand the layers of personality and the fact that none of us is a singularity, but we're all many different people in different stages of our life and different crises of our life. And the characters are really, really interesting, with the exception in To Kill a Mockingbird of Atticus Finch who seems to be a, a, a simple character to understand, just a total nobility. <laughs> uh, that is, until you get to go set a watchman, <laughs> when in fact, of course, uh, uh, all contraire, absolutely not uh, all nobility. Uh, perhaps the most complicated figure she ever wrote about was Atticus Finch, if you put together To Kill a Mockingbird and Go Set a Watchman. But all of her characters tend to be characters who uh, are one kind of person in one kind of situation and another kind of person in another kind of situation. Um, the Cunninghams would be classic examples uh-huh. of this, capable of leading a lynch mob in one setting and then capable of bringing uh, uh, hickory nuts and, and sweet potatoes and other things to pay off debts and feeling this great burden of, of, of gratitude toward his lawyer who was helping him save his land. So... Uh, I think that one thing that Go Set a Watchman did was to give us uh, an imperfect Atticus Finch, which plunges us into the ambiguity you're talking about, which was characteristic of Mrs. DuBose and Dill and the Cunninghams, uh, 
and uh, 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 May Ewell, uh, all of whom are very complicated from the very beginning, whereas Atticus Finch seems not to all, at all be uh, morally complicated at the beginning. But then by the time we get to uh, Go Set a Watchman, was very complicated. And I, as I point out to people all the time, uh, it, it's helpful to remember that uh, Go Set a Watchman was written before uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And however you understand Go Set a Watchman, whether you understand it as a sort of, of imperfect and deeply flawed first draft of To Kill a Mockingbird, which she essentially cannibalized after Tay Hoff and Maurice Crane, her agent and editor at Lippincott, didn't like it very much. Uh, one way of understanding the book is she pulls a lot of material out of Go Set a Watchman and stuffs it into uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and she never really intended that to be a separate standalone book. And that's, uh, I, I guess you can say that's a plausible explanation, because uh, when my wife and I were down there during the great brouhaha over the publication, discovery and publication mm-hmm. of Go Set a Watchman, uh, we asked her, uh, uh, we walked in the door, in fact, and said, uh, well, congratulations on your new book. And she said, what new book? And I thought, oh, my God, she really is losing her memory completely. And I said, Neil, don't don't play with us. Uh, go set a watchman, your new book. And she grinned just as broadly as she could. And she said, Wayne, that's not my new book. That's my old book. <laughs> <laughs> so in her mind, she, she did not do what we do, which is to see To Kill a Mockingbird as the first book and Go Set a Watchman as the second. She saw Go Set a Watchman as the first book and To Kill a Mockingbird as the second. Now, that can be a, a, a clue that she understood that when Maurice Crane and Tayhoff didn't like it, she cannibalized it, pulls the children out of it, enlarges those stories, sets the book in the 1930s, which is a much simpler period in terms of race relations in the South because everybody knew their place. Uh, by that, I mean blacks knew that if they got out of their place, they would die. It was just that simple. Right. They had very few economic recourses. They had no legal recourses. But on the other hand, they also realized that in small towns like Monroe, that if you acted right, if you played your role correctly, uh, if you didn't get in trouble, if you didn't insult white people, if you said yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, uh, that there was a group of very powerful whites who ran towns like that, who were the sheriff and the judge and the and the lawyers and the ministers and the business people, who didn't like the Klan, and they didn't like uh, Klan kind of violence, and they didn't like uh, prohibition, and they didn't like a lot of the moral uh, uh, absolutes of the race culture of whites. And therefore, uh, if you played your black role properly, you could expect support and kindness and assistance during the Great Depression and help when you got in legal trouble or you got sent to jail and some white person would come and pay your bill because they knew you and liked you and you'd work for them. So in that sense, the 1930s is a place where everybody knows their role. By the 1950s, after Brown v. Board, that's not the case anymore. And so, in a sense, I think Maurice Crane and Tay Hawhoff, when they told her America's not ready for this book, her diatribe against her father, her uh, uh, sort of black and white understanding of race, is uh, an in-your-face kind of challenge to apartheid and to a way of life which was not just Southern. You found it in Milwaukee, and you found attitudes like that in Detroit and Philadelphia and lots of other places, too. And uh, I really do think that when Tay Hawhoff and Maurice Crane told her in 1956, America's not ready for this, that was true. (laughs) And, of course, what is happening to her is that having left Monroeville to go to New York City because it was such a lively and different and pluralistic and and, uh, fascinating place to live, and she's reading about Alabama, not in Monroe, but in New York City. And she's reading about the rise of the white citizens' councils and the way they're taking over the state and the politics of the state. And literally, uh, about the time she was finishing Go Set a Watchman, uh, the Boutwell Amendment is passed in, by the Alabama legislature in 1956, which, which provides by a vote of 99 to 1 
that all Alabama schools will be closed rather than integrated. <laughs> right. That is better illiteracy than integration. And she is so furious that she writes uh, a, 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 a book that is almost like Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Isaiah. It is a prophetic book. And it is a book of condemnation, a condemnation of her father, her town, her, her folkways, her culture, everything. And uh, this is the outrage of, well, after all, she, she was born in 1928. Uh, and, and so this is, this is a young woman full of idealism, full of, of, of uh, the way in which New York City understands Alabama and apartheid not the way she was born into it and not the way her parents or brothers or neighbors or anybody else understood apartheid. And in that sense, I can understand why when Maurice Crane and Tehaha say you need to recast this book and, and the, 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 the wonderful uh, childhood stories of coming of age are beautiful stories, just take them out and put them in a different book and recast it to the 1930s when race is so much simpler to understand than it is in 1956. And so uh, no matter how you understand Go Set a Watchman, whether it's the first draft of To Kill a Mockingbird, and therefore when she finished To Kill a Mockingbird, she was done with that story and she never intended that story to be published again, which is one way of understanding it. But uh, The other way of understanding it is that we have two freestanding books and one, uh, to, to quote Oscar Wilde, is a story based upon the fact that when we're young, we think our parents are perfect. And as time passes, we understand that's not true. And almost never, says Oscar Wilde, can we learn to forgive them. This is the idealism of young people who leave their boring uh, uh, Victorian towns and go to uh, the harlotry of New York City because it's exciting and wonderful and different and something's happening all the time. But they take with them something from that past. And the thing they take with them is uh, the innocence of childhood confronting the reality of a world looked at through a different prism of experience, looked through, uh, not through apartheid, but through uh, the possibility of a different racial America that she discovered in New York City. By that standard, uh, as, as she put it uh, when, when we talked to her the day that the uh, book was announced, uh, I, I said, now, uh, it's so exciting for this new book uh, to be published. And she said, Wayne, I don't even remember what the book's about. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness, I know what it's about. And she said, well, I know what it's about, of course, but what I mean is, uh, I haven't worked on this book for 55 years. <laughs> you know, I finished this book in 1956, and uh, something that most people don't know about her is that uh, there there is a sort of uh, arrogance, even in some of her letters, about the book and about comparing it, say, to In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. And, and she believed this book was a really important book. But underlying that is this deep insecurity about her writing. That is manifested in the fact that she uh, didn't send out short stories to be published. She didn't send this to a uh, agent until her friend uh, Michael Brown and Joy Brown, uh, her dearest friends in New York, who and Michael Brown was of course a producer of Broadway shows, and he had an agent. And he said, "Now let me let me recommend this book. I, I mean, your short stories are just wonderful. Let me recommend them to my agent." And she was reluctant. But finally agreed to do that, and then when uh, uh, when uh, Maurice Crane, uh, who became her agent, read some of the stories and said, "I want to meet this woman. <laughs> she she is a wonderful writer, but uh, you know there there uh, maybe there's not much market for short stories, but there's a making here of some of an incredible novel." Well, she, she's reluctant to get reluctant to give the manuscript to Maurice Crane because she's afraid she'll be rejected. So, you know, there's a kind of deep insecurity there, uh, and I'm sure that's what led to her uh, basically dismissing Go Set a Watchman because when two people she really respected told her it was not worthy of publication, uh, her insecurities kick in, and she says, well, no, it's no good. <laughs> and then 
55 years later when uh, when Harper Collins is willing to publish two million copies of it, uh, uh, she's flabbergasted because she doesn't remember it. She didn't work on it. When Harper Collins asked her if she wanted to wordsmith it and do some more work on it, she said, basically, hell no. <laughs> uh, at 89, I'm not going to work on this manuscript. So why did she allow it to be published? Because that's that is something that that so many people speculated on. Is yeah, why did why and, did she allow that? Yeah, and that's the that's one of the side narratives of her dementia is that she she must have been manipulated by her lawyer because uh, having established this great reputation as a writer uh, with one book and having lived as a one book author all all her life, why should she ever agree to something she couldn't even remember? And that uh, obviously must have been flawed because Maurice Crane and Tayhoff told her that. Uh, the explanation of that is born in the Depression and the fact that her family was not well-to-do. They were not rich. They were very ordinary middle-class people in a small town, struggling, struggling, struggling in the 1930s. And that's the that's the world she grew up in. I mean, she's born in 28, so she's a she's a, a, a young girl uh, remembering uh, what her family experienced in the Great Depression. She was very, very aware of material things, uh, and even, even to the point where she remained in this cold water flat in New York City, paying $15 a month under rent control because she was only paying $15 a month. <laughs> Long after she could afford something a lot nicer, she remains in that <laughs> miserable little flat. And uh, literally, when she had her stroke, she was still in a t- small apartment in Manhattan. Uh, when she could have afforded a mansion in Manhattan, she was a child of the Depression. And, uh, well, I can give you uh, three or four scenarios. If her, if her, if her lawyer had gone to uh, her and said, uh, Nell, uh, I found a copy of Ghost Set a Watchman. Do you want me to send it to Harper Collins and get them to publish it? She would have said, hell no. If the lawyer had come and said, Nell, I found a copy of Go set a watchman, and I sent it to an agent, uh, um, Andrew Nuremberg, in London, and he thinks it's really good and should be published. What would you like for me to do? She she would have thought about that a while. If her lawyer had gone in and said, I have found a copy of the book, and I sent it to an agent in London, and the agent sent it to the acquisitions vice president, Harper Collins, and he thinks it's wonderful and worthy of publication, uh, do you want it published? I think she would have probably said yes. But here's the clincher, and this is what I think happened, and I can tell you this only that this is what I think happened because I don't know this is what happened. If the lawyer, if her lawyer had found it, had gotten the approval of her agent, had uh, gotten a, an a, a enthusiastic reception at HarperCollins, and she had a contract in her hand, and she said, now they're going to publish the largest print run of a novel in English ever published in the United States other than the Harry Potter (laughs) novel, the last Harry Potter novel. And uh, and I'm I'm, I'm just going to do the calculations. I don't know what her royalties were, but I would imagine better than 10%, 10%, which is what most people get. And if, uh, if the lawyer had said, and the contract calls for initial publication of 2 million copies at... uh, $26 $26 a copy, and you're going to make, uh, say, oh, let's say 15% uh, royalties, you know, a couple of dollars a piece, which means that uh, you're going to make something in the neighborhood of $12, $15 million uh, before this is all done. Nell would have said, go for it. <laughs> right. She was a material woman from a world of the Great Depression. And uh, she knew she didn't have much to live. And the most important thing, Jonathan, is that she knew her privacy was so complete by then, protected by guards, because she had macular degeneration, she couldn't hear. And it was horribly embarrassing to allow old friends to come visit her because uh, they expected to be recognized, and she didn't recognize them. And they expected to be heard, and she could not hear them. And so you had butcher paper and a Sharpie pen, and you had to write down whatever it was you wanted to tell her, except for me. She could still hear me because she would read my lips, and I got 10 inches away from her right ear, which is the only way she could understand anybody. She couldn't understand my wife at all. She couldn't understand anybody else, which is the reason her lawyer said, uh, 
of, you know, we need to uh, restrict who can come because it's embarrassing for them and it's embarrassing for her. Let me give you an anecdote. Uh, last time we took her to Sweet Tooth, which is a little restaurant, a buffet restaurant in Monroeville, that she liked. Uh, she had uh, sh- uh, 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 shoulder dislocation, and she was in pain when we put her in the car, and and we would get her to the restaurant, and then she would uh, she loved chicken pot pie, and so she got chicken pot pie, and we sat down at a table, and of course everybody in Monroe, the town only has a little over six thousand people, recognize her. Most of the time, they were really respectful of her, and they would not come over and interrupt dinner or lunch or whatever. But this particular day, there was a woman who came up to the table as we were eating her chicken pot pie. And she said, oh, Miss Lee, my mother was was in school with you at Monroe uh, uh, high, high School, and uh, Monroe County High School. And uh, Nell, Nell looked at me and she said, uh, what did she say? And I said very loudly, where everybody in the restaurant could hear it, and of course everybody's listening now, I said, she said that her mother was a classmate of your of yours in Monroe County High School, and she and Nell looked up and said, "Oh, what was your mother's name?" And the woman t- told her her name, and then I repeated the name to Nell very loudly, and Nell said, "Oh, your mother was such a sweet lady." Well, the woman who was uh, interrupting us just absolutely beamed with delight because not only had Nell responded uh, knowledgeably about her mother being a very sweet woman, but everybody in the restaurant had heard this response. <laughs> Uh, the woman says, well, thank you, Miss Lee, and she turns to walk off, and she doesn't get very far away because, as you know, people who are deaf assume everybody's deaf, and therefore they speak very loudly. And as this woman walks toward the door of the restaurant to leave, Nell says so loudly that everybody in the restaurant could hear, Wayne, who the hell was that? <laughs> uh which is, of course, the reason that her lawyer increasingly uh, closed down access to her because it really became very embarrassing. And in addition to that, uh, she w- she'd had a stroke. She was taking medication. Uh, there's nothing to do. It's horribly boring, uh, especially w- for someone with a mind like Carper Lee's. And as a result of that, uh, she would she would go to sleep right after lunch, and she'd sleep most of the afternoon. So if you went to see her, what you saw was a woman in a fetal position on a bed. And, uh, of course, you know, only people who didn't have any courtesy would open the door. But it was amazing how many people would just open the door and go in and stand there or even wake her up. And, in fact, one of the New York Times articles uh, really tickled my wife and me because uh, it said that uh, some anonymous source, which, of course, the Times is famous for, uh, had told one of the reporters, Serge Kozlowski, as I remember, that uh, uh, he had a trusted friend. So you've got an anonymous source. With a, he's a doctor, but he had not treated her medically, which could be, for instance, a minister with a doctorate. And his trusted friend had gone, gone in to see her in the middle of the afternoon, which I guess he assumed was a time when everybody ought to be awake at 89, and had discovered her asleep in a fetal position. And when she woke up, uh, she was disoriented. Well, I can tell you, from our experience over a period of a decade, that if you'd gone in to see her any time in the afternoon, <clears throat> she would have been in a fetal position because she slept in a fetal position. Uh, my wife sleeps on her back. I sleep in a fetal position on my side. Nell did too. And furthermore, I can tell you that if you stood there long enough and if you made noise and woke her up or touched her and woke her up, she came out of a very deep sleep. And she would be disoriented because she couldn't see you and she couldn't hear you. Therefore, she didn't know who the hell you were. And she wondered, what what are you doing beside my bed right, in my private room in an assisted living? And then the New York Times publishes this as an example of her dementia. <laughs> and I can guarantee you, Jonathan, story after story after story about her family uh, exchange of insults, which is one of the best examples of her humor and about her mental acumen. Uh, 
only a few months before she died, she sponsored a production of King uh, King Lear at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, and they invited her to bring her family and friends, come to the patrons' lounge for the opening performance, be introduced, and all of that happened, and we were there. Uh, and uh, during the first act, since she couldn't hear, and she was she had memorized Shakespeare. Uh, when she was taking high school English with Gladys Watson at Monroe County High School, the woman who basically introduced her to the wonderful world of Jane Austen and literature. And uh, and she's remembering lines from King Lear, and she's repeating the lines, which is very disorienting to the people on the stage who are trying to repeat the lines in the play. (laughs) They're getting confused. And uh, the, um, Joy Brown, who was with Nell that day, and her friend from New York, realized uh, that they were getting confused. And so she d- took Nell in her wheelchair out of the out of the area right next to the stage and took her back to the patrons' lounge. And you could very hear Nell very loudly saying, "Where are you taking me? Why are you doing this?" Oh uh, well, she goes back to the patrons' lounge, and at the intermission, we decided that we would stay with her in the second act so that everybody else could go back into the play. So she is in her uh, wheelchair. I walk into the patron's lounge, and uh, I, we exchanged insults. It's just part of our friendship. And so I knelt in front of her, and I said very loudly so that all of her relatives and her agent from London and, and everybody else who was in the room could hear. I said, Nell, you could be King Lear. <laughs> that is the <laughs> mad woman. And uh, just quick as a flash, she responded to me, and you could be my fool. (laughs) And uh, the next week we were down for a visit, and I said, now you remember last week uh, I told you you could be King Lear because you were acting like you were crazy. And you said, yes, and I could be your fool, and she just grinned ear to ear. And I said, well, I just want you to remember that – in Shakespeare's plays, the fool is always smarter than the king. And uh, she laughed uproariously, and then she said, yeah, but it took you a week to think of that, didn't it? <laughs> 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 and Darty, uh, Darty would uh, would be talking to her, my wife, and, and she would say, Darty, you married a maniac. Or, or she would say to me, Wayne, you're much too smart to be a Baptist preacher. <laughs> And uh, the, the last time we were together, two weeks before she died, on the on the seventh of February, two thousand sixteen, uh, we had taken her Mardi Gras beads, Mardi Gras beads from New Orleans, and uh, garish red, gold and <laughs> green, and uh, uh, a little bit earlier. And when we went down on the seventh of February, she had her Mardi Gras beads on around her neck, and her uh, her sitter, African American woman. Uh, who stayed with her in the assisted living, uh, said she loved those Mardi Gras beads, and she wore them all the time during February. And I said, you know, Nell, we just ought to check you out of Meta's assisted living and take you down to New Orleans. And she just glowed. And I said, we could take you down to New Orleans, and you could come off the barrel, and you could uh, drink, and and you could dance your way down Canal Street, and if you wanted, you could just dance naked in the streets. <laughs> and, uh, and and she responded, you've lost your mind, Wayne. And I said, no, you keep insulting me like that. And if when I get to heaven, I'm just going to stand at the gates, and I'm not going to let you in. And she responded, what makes you think you're going to get to heaven before I do or that I'm going to let you in when I get there? <laughs> this was... This was uh, allegedly a demented woman two weeks before she died. <laughs> right. What? What did, was she aware of To Kill a Mockingbird's impor- importance? I know that you oh, wrote letters absolutely. back and forth. Absolutely. In one of the letters she wrote me, uh, uh, she she describes the uh, well. The, the story was the uh, performance of the movie Capote and, and uh, Hoffman, Seymour Hoffman, Hoffman winning the Academy Award. And just before that, uh, uh, Lynn Nearing, uh, or one of the reporters for uh, National Public Radio, had, had uh, contacted me about a letter that had been sent by Truman Capote uh, to his uh, uh, his uh, uncle Jennings Carter, or cousin Jennings Carter, and uh, this 
letter had just been given by the Carter family to the little museum in Monroeville. The letter said, uh, this is 1959, when Truman and Jack Dunphy, his partner, come back from Italy to live in New York again. And he said, I have uh, I've just read uh, uh, the, the manuscript of To Kill Mockingbird, and we have a wonderful uh, author on our hands. And Nell had already told us that he had not read the manuscript because he was in Italy. Uh, that from 1956 until 1959, he had not read uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, but he had read sections of it that she had worked on earlier while he was home visiting his mother. And so it's pretty clear that uh, uh, he was not the author of To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a rumor that he spread from time to time in private gatherings in New York City. And as a result of that, uh, uh, since she was a one book author, uh, the the rumor stuck in some people's minds that if she just wrote one book, well, this must have been Truman's book. And of course, that's the letter in the, in my book, Mockingbird Songs, where she says, uh, Truman is the kind of person who if someone had said, I have terrible news, President Kennedy's just been assassinated, that Truman's response would have been, I know I was driving the car. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so what she told me uh she said in, in the letter that I cite in my book, she said, uh, the truth of the matter is, Truman could never get over the fact that I had won a Pulitzer Prize and co- in cold blood, never won a Pulitzer Prize, it never won a National Book Award, and it never sold 40 million copies. And even though it was a critical, critically acclaimed book, and she even denied that it started a new genre of literature, uh, which, of course, Truman claimed. Um, non-fiction fiction or fiction non-fiction but at any rate uh, uh, she said the problem with with Truman was that after 1965 uh, and the publication of In Cold Blood uh, he was just insanely jealous and he was so hurt by his lack of winning either the Pulitzer or the National Book Award that he returns to uh, uh, his alcoholism gets worse his drug use gets worse Uh, He becomes promiscuous again. He breaks the relationship with Jack Dunphy, and his life just descends. And she said, that's when uh, I realized I I did not push Truman away. Truman pushed me away. I wanted to be his friend, but he wouldn't let me be his friend. To a lot of people, Harper Lee's life is... Um, you know, leading up to the publication of To Kill a Mockingbird. And then, you know, she sort of resurfaced on everybody's radar as a person more dimensional than simply the author of To Kill a Mockingbird with the publication of Ghost at a Watchman. What, what, kind of, what kind of fill-in can you give us, uh, you know, of the decades in between, just so that our listeners are, are sort of familiar uh, with, with Harper Lee in, in in more of a way than just the author, because you've described somebody who, who you know was was obsessed with with her Southern heritage and researching her family history and uh, involved in all these different things. These are things that most people don't know. That's correct. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, my wife asked her that question on one occasion not long before her death. She said, "Now, uh, you just became so." Famous, and I had just done a program for ABC Australian Radio, this public radio network, uh, and they had a program somewhat like yours. Uh, they asked their readers to the first year they did the book club. They asked them for their favorite British writers, and then they spent one month. I think it was ten months. They spent each month dealing with one of those writers in much the way you do, and. Uh, of course, I think the first one mentioned was Shakespeare in the English, and the next one was Jane Austen. Well, the first one mentioned the second year when they did American Writers was Harper Lee. And so um, I'm on the program, and uh, Mary Murphy, who did a, a, a American Masters on uh, Nell, was on the program. There was also uh, an Australian 14-year-old who was actually reading at the time the primary Australian uh, Harper Lee Scholar was on the radio, and we have this long radio program uh, on Australian public radio. And I tell Nell about it. And uh, I say, you know, Nell, it m- must feel incredible to to be so famous that that you are chosen 
of all the American writers, <laughs> you know, Steinbeck and uh, all the others, you're chosen as the favorite author of, 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 of American fiction. Uh, and she said, Wayne, it is a great burden to carry. She said, uh, it took my privacy away from me. And I couldn't go anywhere in Monroeville because everyone recognized me. And, and in New York, even, she said, even the most anonymous city in America, it was difficult for me to go out. Uh, on one occasion, not long after To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, was published. She goes into a bookstore in New York City, and uh, when they took her check or whatever she paid with, uh, the person who did it said, oh, you're the one who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. And she said, no, that was my sister. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the degree to which she lost the privacy, which was such a central part of her personality. Uh, when, when she left Monroeville, where everybody knew her, uh, I asked her one time, "Did you did you leave because Truman was in New York, your your best friend?" She and of course Truman actually left in '49. When she arrived, he wasn't there. He and Jack Dunphy had headed off for their long tenure hajara in uh, Western Europe. And she said, "No, why? I didn't leave because Truman was there." Uh, it, true, he had just published other voices, other rooms, and true, he told me I ought to get out of Monroeville and come. But she said, "I left Monroeville because it was just so boring." <laughs> It was so hopelessly boring, and New York City was so exciting. She's like any other 29-year-old, uh, or 23-year-old. She was 23 at the time she went, 29 when she wrote uh, uh, Go Set a Watchman. But she said, I was just so excited to get out of Monroeville. She's every 18-year-old leaving every small town in America that is that is you know, turned inward on itself, that is slowly dying, uh, where there's nothing to do. And looking to the Big Apple and the excitement of a place like Toronto, if you're from some little burg out in Halifax, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, near Halifax. Uh, she, she, she's like everybody who wants the big city, who wants Montreal and Toronto. They don't want Monroe and, and uh, East Aboga. And so that's that's the magnet that draws her into that, that world. And the price she paid for it was the price she paid for her fame was the loss of what, at that point, was most important to her, which was her privacy. Well, you're a, you're a Southern historian, so I assume that you spend a lot of time <clears throat> researching and talking about these, these little small towns and these little burgs as opposed to big cities. What do you think about her book now captures something about a, a traditional South uh, that's dying with all of its goods and its bads? A uh, terrific question, and uh, I'm going to recast the question just a tiny bit. Uh, if you if you come from a place that is deeply conflicted, if you come to a fl- from a place where your feelings are neither good nor bad, but some combination of both, uh, if it's a place of an incredible sense of community and belonging, where you think someone's always ha- someone always has your back that no matter what kind of trouble you get into, that you've got friends and family that will get you out of it. Uh, No matter how bad times become, there'll be somebody who will bring you a sack of potatoes or will offer you a job. Uh, If if you come from that kind of place, uh, you always live in an ambivalent literary world that is both full of possibility and hope and dreams, but also full of disappointment and tragedy and horrible uh, injustice. And that was the South that I write about. That's the South I've written written about for more than half a century, uh, the good and the bad. In fact, uh, when I was the senior editor, the first editor of the Online Encyclopedia of Alabama, I told supporters that we weren't going to try to sugarcoat Alabama. <laughs> you can't sugarcoat Alabama because you make it unbelievable and people say, oh, Shoot, I don't care if two of the ten most important women of the 20th century in America did come from Alabama. It can't be much of a state. Uh, But truth of the matter is, Helen Keller and Rosa Parks, who were named two of the ten most admired women in American history, uh, both came from Alabama, not to mention Nell Harper Lee. Uh, 
one of its greatest writers. Right. So uh, if, if that's the only story you tell, and you don't tell the story of the Scottsboro Trials, and you don't tell the story of the Birmingham Children's March of 1963, and you don't tell the story of the Montgomery bus boycott, and you don't tell the story of lynching, and you don't tell the story uh, of, of uh, legal injustice, then nobody's going to believe you. And if you look back, over, say, the, the life that produced Erskine Caldwell or that produced Eudora Welty or that produced, uh, produced Flannery O'Connor or uh, I could go through list after, list after list. Kind of curious that between 1933 and 1977, a pretty critical period in American history in the 20th century, between 1933 and 1977, the South had uh, one-fourth of the nation's people, one-third of its poverty, and produced 40% of its Pulitzer Prize winners in fiction. Wow. And you try, to get your, you try to get your head around that very simple statistic. Uh, it had one-fourth of the population, most of them uneducated. It had one-third of its poverty. It had most of its worst apartheid and certainly most of its lynching and injustice. And it produces 40% of its Pulitzer Prize winners in in, uh, in fiction. And you start remembering who they were. <laughs> uh, and you're thinking of William Faulkner and Eutora Welty and, and uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor. And you just, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And uh, most of that literature was born out of conflict and injustice. And romanticism. And romanticism, yeah, there's a lot of Gothic romance there too. But uh, take Shirley Ann Grau, Keeper of the House, the story of a of a, 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 a white widower and his black housekeeper who becomes his mistress, and then he decides on a career in politics. But he realizes there's the shadow, the shadow of this uh, misogynist relationship, which will damn him if anyone ever finds out about it. Then you know Faulkner, plug Faulkner in, or plug Harper Lee in. Uh, um, and before long you begin to understand that it is precisely the conflict and precisely the poverty and precisely the hypocrisy and precisely the religious turmoil. Uh, it, it's, it's the kind of fundamentalist white uh, and black uh, evangelicalism that uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor both makes fun, fun of and in mystery and man manner stands off and says, "Oh my God, what what an incredible complex world of religious understanding <laughs> exists here." Right. And uh, to some degree, uh, I think it is the story of of all peoples in a transitional period with intense poverty and intense conflict and intense injustice, and the, the writers who try to stand away from that, apart from that and make sense out of all of it. And I think it is precisely Nell's attempt to render all that is loving and good and all that is conflicted and evil in both of her novels that makes her truly one of the great voices of 20th century American literature. Well, I'll ask you one final question, and I'll make it a difficult one for you. <laughs> you've talked to her, you've you've gotten letters from her, you've, you've heard hours upon hours of her stories, so leave our listeners with one last story that gives them an idea of the essence of what made Harper Lee herself. Wow. <laughs> that is a that that is a that is a terrific question. Um okay. Uh, here it is. We're having a we're in a conversation about uh about Monroe and uh, this is just after uh, Ghost Set of Watchmen has been announced, and the, the furor has begun, and various people who knew her and had written about her said, oh, well, this is her lawyer uh, who, who uh, is lying about her mental condition and is uh, exploiting her for her own financial benefit by, quote, finding this novel and then having this unworthy novel published. Uh, and this is an obvious example of her dementia and her incapacity to give informed consent. So um, her nephew, who is the family historian, his name is, is Hank Connor, uh, and um, Hank was with her 
a couple of months before the publication of the book, and on five occasions over several days, uh, said, Nell, do you really want this book published? Because you have a great classic book. And he said, I read this book when I was growing up in the 1950s and visiting Grandpa and Grandma in, uh, in uh, Monroeville. And I don't think this is worthy of you. I don't think this is worthy of being published. And he said on five occasions over two days, she said, I want, yes, I want this published. Yes, I want this published. Uh, this is my story, and so I want this published. So we're down there, and, and uh, I, I said, Nell, uh, uh, it's such great news about your, your, uh, your new book. And Darty said, uh, Nell, people are contacting us from all over. Uh, we stay, Wayne stays on the phone seven, eight, nine hours a week talking with reporters from all over the world about your old book and your new book. And uh, Darty said, you must be so proud. And she said, uh, all I did was to write a book. All I did was to write a book. And there is this long pause, and she said, and it destroyed all my privacy. And it was it was the ultimate uh, uh, example of the refrain from people like her that this fame stuff can kill you. <laughs> this fame stuff is a double-edged sword. Uh, what it what it cuts through in terms of hypocrisy and contradiction and ambiguity and reveals to those who love your literature, it also tears away from you because in a celebrity culture like ours, people think that if they love you, they have a right to know everything about you. And those who loved her most were the ones that drove her crazy <laughs> because they they wanted to know more. They wanted to know more. They wanted her to be the subject of a, of a radio program. Uh, they wanted uh, ABC Australian Radio to uh, cast her in the in the role of the most important American writer of the 20th century. And uh, the one time that I saw her uh, tear up, uh, the night that I uh, was on ABC. Australian radio, there was someone who called in, and we were talking about the importance of the book and the characters and which character you identified with, whether whether uh, Atticus or Jim or, or Dill or Scout or who. And there was a man who called in and said, uh, I can tell you who I identified with. He said I was in high school at the time, the equivalent of high school in Sydney, and I was bullied. I was small, and I was kind of effeminate, and I was bullied. And he said, I was seriously contemplating suicide. And in 1961, I read the Heinemann, the British copy, published copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. And he said, I was Boo Radley. I became Boo Radley. I became the person who is the other, the eternal other, the one misunderstood, the one behind the gate and behind the door that never let out. And if people could just know who I was, I, I would, they would like me. But somehow they could never understood who I was, understand who I was. He said, I, I decided not to commit suicide. I decided to finish school, go to college. He said, I did. And he said, now I run a very large company in Sydney, and I call it Atticus. I, I kept thinking to myself when he said that, why didn't you call it Boo Radley? <laughs> yeah. But I guess Atticus was his short form of that word. And she, when I told her that story, Jonathan, she teared up, and she just sat there sort of tremulous for, for a few minutes. And she said, all I ever did was to write one book. And I said, well, uh, that one book kept one young Australian boy alive who might not have been alive if it hadn't been for that one book. And uh, she just sat there in silence for a long time. I think that's perhaps the most revealing story that I could tell you about her. Well, Dr. Flynn, thank you so much for taking the time. You're very welcome.